Good morning, everyone. I thank the organizers for the invitation. I thank Nigel for putting so much hope in the speakers and for placing me first. So uh, I'm going to present some uh, work uh, on the key management services of uh, AWS. And this is joint work with Matt Campagna, who is somewhere here, happy that he's not on stage being grilled. So uh, this is our work. So the outline, I'm going to describe the outline of the KMS, the service, then describe the limitation on a naive use of ASGCM in a cloud scale, and then what we do or what mode of operation is being used in order to address this uh, problem. And we're going to go through some security bounds of the system. So what is KMS? So uh, Amazon's KMS is a web-based service, first of all. Provides you, the user, the customer, a simple interface to generate a key, to rotate it, manage it, and to um, uh, send encryption and decryption uh, queries so that you can encrypt, uh, encrypt files and uh, decrypt files and even allow others to decrypt uh, files per uh, your permission. So um, there is a notion of a customer master key, which is the root of trust of everything for, from the viewpoint of the customer. And this is managed and protected in hardware, whereas the user actually is using this key implicitly, only through an API with a, with a request to encrypt, decrypt, or rotate, or generate a key, but actually doesn't uh, need to see the key or to own the key, at least as the default configuration. So here is an outline of how things happen. You have some access control policy. As a customer of this service, you can just uh, dispatch a create key request, and this will invoke a sequence, first, first of all, everything needs to be authenticated to, to know that you have uh, the right to, to make this uh, request. And then a new customer master key, CMK, is being generated and it is stored. Everything is done inside HSM, so it never leaves out. What goes out is the key ID. After you have the key ID, next time you can invoke requests with this uh, key ID. So you have a file here, you want to encrypt it. You need to log into the system, then send an encryption uh, request with your key ID and the plain text, and eventually what happens in the system, first of all, do you have the right permissions and credentials? Then the system will retrieve the uh, customer master key, the CMK, uh, through the key ID, do the encryption, send back the cipher text. Everything here is happening within the boundaries of the secure facility and the HSMs. So here is just a, a small demonstration of how a sequence of, of calls would be. So user A, okay, generate, generate uh, a, a, a key and uh, generate a, a key for this session with this key ID, and then you can encrypt the file, you know, delete. A user B can say, retrieve the data key that was used to encrypt this file. If I have these permissions, then request the decryption, and uh, so forth. So basically, the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, premise is that the customer master key is never leaving the premises of the secure environment, but through, um, through the access control, the owner of this customer master key can use it. All right, so a few items here. Uh, CMKs are stored encrypted and only decrypted on the HSMs. Uh, they cannot leave the HSM. There is an exception, this is the default, but if you will, if you wish so, you can deposit your own key, right? And, and enjoy the same, uh, the same security promise, of course, with the, uh, with the exception that the, uh, you cannot make the statement that the CMKs cannot leave the security boundary. They have left, they were created outside. But once they are there, they never go out. Now, the access is restricted, only, only a limited set of uh, audited uh, APIs. Uh, 
plain text and cipher text are not stored or logged by the system. Well, actually, the system is, is uh, geared to, uh, to uh, use, to provide you a, a session key or a, for, for some usage, which is a short uh, uh, value. And the encryption uses AES-256 GCM with a random 96-bit IV. Why random? Because the system is distributed, of course, you cannot, you cannot do anything else but the random uh, IV. The maximum plain text size is four kilobytes. The maximum AAD is uh, eight kilobytes. The AADs are logged. I mean, this is part of how you retrieve uh, your uh, keys eventually. And they can be configured to rotate uh, yearly. When you rotate the key, the next encryption request you make are going to use the new customer master key. Of course, everything is uh, for backward uh, compatibility. Old keys are used only for decryption. So now we know how the system works. And how about a naive usage of AES GCM? So we have the durable storage that holds the encrypted customer master keys. Let's say we have you users. In the distributed HSMs, they pull out a customer master key, and now you can encrypt many files. So let's think of a setup where we have you users. Each one of them is able to encrypt Q files. So is this a scalable mode of operation for this type of system at this, uh, this uh, volume that we intend. So we need to remember that ASGCM with a random IV is limited in use. Actually, the specification is telling you that you should never invoke encryption with probability to repeat an IV larger than uh, 2 to the minus 32. This actually is telling you that you cannot use the same key to encrypt more than two to the 32 files. All right, so this is four billions, but in a cloud scale, four billion is not a large number. And uh, of course, as the cloud provider, we want to make sure that uh, um, collisions of customer master key and random IV are, are, um, are prevented across new users. So a collision on the CMK has negligible probability. If you are really selecting a random 256-bit key and you have U users, so the probability is U squared over 2 to the 257, okay, we're good to go here. This is not the problem. The problem is what happens with the customer master key being used by each of the users for many encryptions. So I'm going to describe here a general concept that uh, is work with, uh, joint work that uh, I did with Yuda uh, Lindel from bar -Ilan University, and we presented this in CCS uh, uh, recently, and we call it a derived key mode. So this is a way we view to extend the lifetime of a key. So basically, it is very easy. You have a context of a scheme, an encryption scheme that accepts a nonce, AAD and the message, and you have a key. So instead of using naively the key, every nonce is, is passed through a KDF with some key. This KDF spits out a nonce-derived key for this session, and now you invoke your scheme, the same scheme with this nonce, coming from the other side, the same AAD, the same input, and with this key, and, and, and uh, you get out the ciphertext. All right, so let me just review some, say, the security bounds of this type of usage. So what is the, advers uh, the adversary's advantage when he can use n different nonces? So it is the sum of the advantage of three factors. The advantage for n key derivations, whatever KDF is being used, plus, at most, right, uh, the multi-instance experiment of ciphers, so you have a cipher used with uh, n keys, hopefully n keys, we'll see what happens if the keys collide, and then whatever property is for the original scheme, in our case it's going to be ASGCM, when the, when the encryption scheme, when the, the block cipher is uh, replaced with a random function. Now, number one depends on, 
on, on, on the actual uh, uh, K, KDF. Number two depends on what we're willing to assume on the block cipher. And for AES, what we're willing to assume is that AES is, uh, with a random key, is indistinguishable from a random permutation beyond the birthday bound, way beyond the birthday bound. So this is a standard assumption that we all hope is true. And, uh, and now, the number three depends on the scheme. How the scheme behaves if everything were to be completely random. So let me give you one example on the simplest, uh, on the simplest mode, which is counter mode, how we use this uh, setup. So in counter mode, AES counter mode with a unique 96-bit uh, nonce, if B is the total number of locks encrypted under a key, and Bmax is the maximum number of locks in a message, then the counter mode advantage is B squared over 2 to the 129. If you prepend the key derivation, actually, you can prove that the bound is n times Bmax squared over 2 to 128. And there is a big difference, because if we take 2 to the 48 encryptions, each one of them has 2 to the 16 blocks in length, then Counter mode is broken. Well, this is the birthday bound. But the key derived mode over counter mode has a 2 to the minus 46 uh, advantage. And basically, here what it says that you can even do 2 to the 64 plain text encryptions of, uh, of length 2 to the 16 blocks and still remain with this magic bound of 2 to the minus 32. So this is a way we can say we extend the lifetime of a key. Now let's go to the actual encryption mode of KMS. So it is using uh, AES GCM and we have uh, an AAD, we have the, the message, and the number of blocks of the message is at most 500, uh, of the AAD is at most 512 blocks. The message itself is at most 256 blocks. And the KDF is the, the next uh, KDF based on counter mode with uh, the PRF HMAC SHA-256. Now, what are the steps for the encryption? If you have a, a, a master key, you select uniform random nonce, a 16-byte nonce, and a 12-byte IV. Now you derive a 30-byte wrapping key from the KDF, and this is going to be the encryption key for that uh, file, and then use AES-256 GCM with this wrapping key, the random IV, uh, a and M. It's a little variation over what I said before. If you remember, uh, uh, the, um, the derived key mode is actually using the same nonce as input, but here, uh, are, the, the nonce and the IV, both of them are, are randomized and input to the scheme, but basically it's the same, it's the same idea. All right. So, pictorially, there are two random derivations, 128 bits nonce, 96 bits IV, and this is the scheme. So nonce, AAD, message, go into ASGCM, but the key is whatever was derived uh, from, the, from this uh, KDF and a new nonce. Now, we're going to see if this solved the problem on a large scale. Remember that if we were just to use ASGCM directly with a random IV, then each customer would be limited to 2 to the, 38 at mo uh, two to the um, 32 at most if, if we want to enforce the, the NIST bounds on the, uh, which are part of the specification of ASGCM. All right, so we have two perspec perspectives to consider from the, use, the customer's perspective and the cloud provider, and they are different. So the customer is in a multi-key scenario because the keys are derived, each, each, uh, each encryption presumably is deriving a new key. And the cloud provider is concerned with multi-user over multi-key scenario, which is a higher, higher key. All right, so let's see the customer's perspective. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what is the probability that a key and IV will be reused. This is a bad event, right? So what... Uh, what uh, um, and, and then the second thing we want to see, what advantage is there for somebody who views all the ciphertext to distinguish them from random? 
And then what protection do we have uh, against forgery on the authentication of the ASGCM? And what is the probability of recovering one of the wrapping keys from all of those that you've used as a customer to encrypt files? So all of these considerations actually come from this theorem and we're going to review them and see if this is good enough or actually how many encryptions can each customer do where there are overall you customers and still everything is uh, the advantage, cumulative advantage is below two to the minus 20 or two to the minus 30. So that's the, <coughs> the question. So let's see, let's see a derived key IV collision. So of course you can do the math on the fly and check that I didn't make a mistake here, but uh, you'll have to, to put some trust in the computations. So, so what is the probability that two nonsense collide? That's easy. If you have a Q, um, a a Q nonsense that have been derived for Q, Q messages, then it's Q squared over two to the 128. Okay, what is the probability that three or more will collide? Okay, this requires some more uh, some more uh, thought, and you can bound it by Q cubed over six times two to the 256. And this is negligible as long as Q is less than two to the 64. We are only interested in reaching the birthday bound. This is enough. All right, I'll give you another lemma. What is the probability that 10 keys or more uh, are, are repeated? Uh, it is less than two to the minus 32. You need some work, but okay. All right, so let's say that at most two keys were repeated. This means that Q minus 20 files were encrypted with unique keys and 10 pairs of files were encrypted with the same key. But this is not really, uh, really a disaster. It just says that, that uh, most of the files, Q minus 20, were used once to encrypt a single message and, and, and 10 of them were used to encrypt two messages. So if you combine all of this together and you do some computation, okay, the probability of a bad event happening is one over two to the 91. Okay, we are happy with this. So as long as Q, the number of files that a, a customer has encrypted is not more than two to the 64, two to the 64 we are good with the NIST probability of collisions. All right, one thing is done. Next thing, what is the PRP, PRF advantage? All right, the message, longest message is 256 blocks, which means that 257 blocks have been encrypted because there is one more block encrypted in ASGCM to mask the, the G hash, the, the universal hash. All right, so what is the advantage? PRP, PRF advantage, 257 squared over two to the 129. Okay, we are good here. Now, when two keys collide, so then, then the number of blocks is twice that uh, uh, the amount uh, above, so this is 514 blocks, okay, we have an expression. If, again, you, the customer has encrypted at most two to the 64 files, then we do this computation, and the indistinguish indistinguishability advantage is less than, 100 and, uh, than uh, Q, uh, Q over 2 to the 110, and we are good to go here. All right, next, what is the forgery protection? All right, so what is the forgery success uh, probability in ASGCM? It's, it depends on the longest message. So the um, number of blocks in the AAD plus the number of blocks in the message plus one, if we want to really be precise, 769 uh, blocks is, is, is the most uh, you, you can see. So the forgery probability is uh, 769 over two to the 128. I think we are good, uh, we are good to go here. Remember that decryptions happen in this system at 1,200 times per second at most. So I think we can all agree that it is not, that forgery is not a threat in this system for whatever number of attempts you can possibly do. Okay, we are happy here. What about key recovery? So if you think about it, there is a customer who is using a single customer master key and encrypting many messages. 
But if you look at the encryption scheme at AES, encrypting X time a fixed block, then you can recover the key with probability of X over two to the key length. Fortunately, the key length here is 256. We are happy. And the probability, so first, in order to encrypt the same block, the minimal, minimal assumption is that the IV repeated. So let's say, what is the probability that an IV was repeated at five times or more? So we can compute this. To, okay, two to the 320 over five factorial uh, times two to the 384. You do some calculations. Okay, believe me, this is a very small, negligible number, even if Q is two to the 64. Of course, two to the 64 is like a magic number. Of course, I, I hope that nobody thinks that there are going to be two to the 64 encryptions so fast, right? But we want to have this up to the birthday uh, bound. So this is negligible. Now we go to the cloud provider, provider's perspective. So what, what is the probability to have this catastrophe derived key and IV collision across all the users? And what is the advantage of an adversary who can observe all of the encryption files, not only for a single customer, for all of the U users of the system. And uh, of course, forgeries, uh, forgery probability doesn't change, right? Uh, here with the number of, uh, of uh, samples uh, th that you see, because it is limited by some rate, and each one of them is protected with the bound that we saw before. And of course, what is the probability of recovering one of the wrapping keys? So now, if you think about it, we have U users, each one of them is encrypting Q files. Okay, this is a huge quantity. So let's start again with the same sweep across all these problems. So what is the problem? What is the probability to have a collision over U users who requested U customer master keys? Okay, U squared squared over two to the 50, uh, uh, 57. And with this lemma of uh, things don't, uh, don't repeat more than 10 times with negligible probability, we can just say that if we have, uh, uh, we have uh, 2 squared over 2 to the 97, this is the number for the IV collision, to the power 10, we are happy here because the probability that we'll have a collision is uh, is eventually linear with the number of users. It is u over 2 to the 91, and okay, whatever number of users you are going to use here, which is reasonable, let's say below 2 to the 50, 2 to the 40, we are happy. All right, now what about derived key collisions? What happens here? So remember, there are two possibilities. We have a 16 bytes, random nonce, and uh, uh, 256 bits uh, customer, customer master key. So again, the collision probability you can, you can uh, compute is U times Q squared over 2 to the 385. And uh, a collision of the KDF I output is also uh, expressible as U times Q squared over 2 to the 257. So even if we have Two to the 48 users, each one of them is doing two to the 64 encryptions. What is the probability of a bad event? Okay, it is two to the 64, two to the 48 squared, but divided by two to the 57, okay. This is two to the minus uh, 33, and this is our magic number, if you remember the NIST specification. Don't use a yes GCN if the probability of repeating an IV is mo more than two to the minus 32. So, okay. We are happy with all this a number of users. And the last, I think the last, okay, PRP, PRF advantage, we do the same, uh, the same uh, exercise as before because the messages are limited in, 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 in length and the advantage is actually linear in U times Q. All right. So, two to the 40 users, 
let's say, each one of them is crunching two to the 50 encryptions, all in this, the advantage is, is less than one over two to the 20. So we are always doing the worst of the worst uh, cases to, to check the bounds of, of this uh, system in this multi-user, multi-key scenario. Now, what about key recovery? There are so many encryptions. Just imagine that everyone was encrypting the same block. Well, this is the worst, the worst case scenario, right? Because we will have uh, the same block encrypted under many, many keys, and we have the, this key recovery property. So in a multi-key scenario, we have x over 2 to the uh, two, uh, 256 in our case to recover a key. This is the probability to recover a key, or if you wish, this is the amount of work you need to do in order to recover a key. And now we ask ourselves, okay, how large can x be? So we have u users, each one of them is doing q encryptions, and now let's ask ourselves, let's be, you know, rude. What is the probability that, uh, that an, a 96-bit IV would repeat more than 16 times? All right? Because then we want to bounce. So the probability to do this miraculously, okay, we work this out this way, right? Ends up as one over 16 factorial. Now if you do the math, and you are taking two to the 40 users, each one of them is doing two to the 50, and we want to see how many blocks can be possibly encrypted, how many times a sing, a, 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 the same block can be possibly encrypted under different keys, and uh, so the probability that this is 16 is less than two to the mi minus 44. All right, so we are happy here, we can say that we are safe, even with this number of two to the 90 encryptions overall. And you can, you can realize now that if we were not doing all this derivation, we would be clobbered before that because the AES GCM, or as far as I know, any mode of operation with AES that is 128-bit block cipher, you cannot, you cannot uh, cross the birthday bound. And if you want to leave a margin of 2 to the minus 32, you have to stop way, way before that. So this is exactly the consequence of the, um, of the key derivation. So in summary, we have a secure cloud scale implementation over an encryption scheme that we can support up to two to the 40 use, um, users or master keys. I mean, a user can request more than a single master key. So it's not a one-to-one one relation necessarily. And each master key, each user can perform two to the 50 encryptions. And I checked the Earth's population in, in 2017, just so we have 7.2 billion people. So, as much, so it's something like two to the 32.7 users. So, uh, so even if everyone on Earth would be requesting a customer master key and would do two to the 50 encryptions, and then uh, we are still safe and have this wonderful security margin with AES-GCM with the twist of the key derivation mode. And I will conclude with that. Thank you very much. Great. I guess we have time for uh, one question, if, there's any, if there are any questions. An easy question? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I ask an easy question? So All right, easy question. You mostly talked about the mode of encryption, but yes. um, how much support do you give customers, for example, in uh, key management services, if they want to rotate keys or... Ah, all right. Like so, so there is, um, there are some, uh, I would say, um, default. So a key would be rotated after a year. S but you can, you can request a key rotation. And then that, how, how would that work? Well, you start, uh, you start from fresh, so, so that's it. Our worry was actually to show that you can have a, cu a customer who can safely encrypt as many, as many files as, as possibly conceivable, and many of them are doing the same thing without key rotation, and we are still safe. Right? If you rotate the key every time, then uh, things are easy. So it, it, if, you, if you want to look at this, it's like taking AES-GCM and scaling it up two levels 
the, the user is doing many, many encryptions, more than two to the 32, which is the, the, the bound, and there are also two to the 40 users doing the same. So this is the, the scaled problem. Yeah, any other, any other questions? If not, then let's thank Sean well, again. Okay, thank you very much.